We all know and love the Hawker Siddeley Harrier, the United Kingdom's famous vertical takeoff and landing or VTOL jet. It was truly a phenomenal aircraft, which achieved feats of performance long imagined impossible from a fixed wing aircraft, and it won itself fans and accolades the world over as a result of being awesome. But what you may not know was that the Harrier had a communist rival, a failed usurper to the VTOL throne that was every bit as terrible as the Harrier was fantastic. The Yak-38, a technological disappointment riddled with significant design flaws and operational limitations. It couldn't match the Harrier's performance, range, or weapons capacity, and its service life was marred by high accident rates and poor adaptability to diverse weather conditions. But one man's trash is another man's treasure, as they say. And what was a disaster for the Soviets makes for a fascinating story for us. So that's nice. The story of the Yak-38 begins during the darkest days of World War II, when a new titan of naval warfare was rising to the fore the aircraft carrier. Casting long shadows on the waves, these mighty ships were the latest must-have in naval technology, acting as floating air bases and projecting the reach of their nation's air power far beyond their territorial waters. Their strategic and tactical utility was apparent for all to see, and every great power of the time wanted them. The Soviet Union was no exception to this, but they found themselves a step behind their capitalist rivals because as World War II came to a close, it didn't have a single aircraft carrier in its naval arsenal. This maritime deficit echoed even louder as the Cold War progressed, and obtaining these mighty ships became a bit of an obsession for the Soviet Navy. This thirst would eventually be quenched in the 1970s with the inception of the Soviet Union's first aircraft carriers, the Kiev class. Now, if we wish to be pedantic here, and we do, the Kiev class were not true aircraft carriers. Rather, they were aircraft cruisers, ships designed to carry both aircraft and a significant battery of traditional ship cannons rather than just aircraft. But for our purposes today, this difference is neither here nor there. The Soviets had carriers, and now they needed aircraft to operate from said carriers. But what sort of aircraft should that be? Well, in answering that question, the Soviets had three options. Conventional takeoff and landing, CTOL, short takeoff and landing, STOL, and VTOL, each with their own upsides and their own drawbacks. CTOL aircraft, as the name implies, require a runway for both takeoff and landing. These aircraft are characterized by their high speed, heavy payload, and long range capabilities. However, these aircraft require long runways, space that is typically not available on aircraft carriers, and so require takeoff aids such as catapults and ramps to operate effectively, aids that are typically expensive and pretty difficult to engineer. STOL aircraft are aircraft with very short takeoff range, an obvious plus when operating from a carrier, but typically this takeoff performance comes at a cost because they must be very light to achieve such performance, which does limit the amount of fuel and munitions that they can carry. For some, this trade off is a fair compromise because while these aircraft can't match the payload and range of their CTOL counterparts, they offer increased versatility, particularly for smaller carriers such as the Kiev class. The third option, VTOL represents the pinnacle of operational flexibility, being able to take off and land vertically, doing away with the need for a runway altogether. However, this flexibility does come at a cost. VTOL aircraft often must sacrifice payload and range capabilities due to the weight and complexity of their lift systems. Moreover, the added complexity of these systems can lead to higher maintenance demands and lower operational availability. For the Soviets, VTOL was the no-brainer choice. But not actually for the reasons that you might think. That careful balance of capabilities that we discussed a moment ago was considered at length, but ultimately the AK-38's form would be decided by something much more asinine. Cold War willy waving. For you see, on 28th of December 1967, the British first tested their own VTOL aircraft, the Mighty Harrier. The world's press erupted into fanfare over the coming days, and the Soviets naturally decided that they'd like some of that cooing directed their way. Thank you very much. And so, on December the 31st, 1967, it was decided that the Soviets' own carrier fighter should be VTOL, just like the Harrier. The architects 
of the Yakolev Design Bureau emerged bleary-eyed from their New Year's festivities, and they began working on what would become the Yak-38, drawing on their previous experiences with the Yak-36 and earlier experimental VTOL prototype. The preliminary design envisioned a supersonic craft that bore a bit of a striking resemblance to the Hawker P-1154, which was a prototype for the Harrier. This early design was to be a mighty machine, deriving insane power from two Tomansky R27-300 engines. But developing a supersonic VTOL aircraft proved to be much easier said than done, and after repeated issues, they instead decided to keep things simple and limited the Yak-38 to a maximum speed of less than Mach 1. This simplification sped up the design process immeasurably, and by April 1970, the first prototype was completed and made its maiden flight in December of that same year. Results from this initial test were promising, and so work moved to further refining the aircraft, specifically its novel VTOL capabilities. The aircraft was deemed ready after a few more years of testing and refining, and full production began in earnest in 1973. After additional testing and crew training, the Yak-38 was officially inducted into the Soviet Navy in August 1977, with over 140 of them being built by the time production ended in 1982. So, now that we know how the Yak-38 was made, let's take the time to look at what was made and start seeing why it was just so sh**. The Yak 38's standout feature was, of course, its VTOL capability, which was achieved with a clever arrangement of its engines. Nestled behind the cockpit were two small, dedicated lift engines, the sole purpose of which was to hurl the aircraft skyward during takeoff. Complementing these was a single main Tomansky R27 jet engine with adjustable nozzles that could be pointed downward for vertical flight and backwards for horizontal flight. This pushed the Yak 38 up to a top speed of 1,230 km per hour, which is just under Mach 1. It had a range of 1,300 kilometers, not transcontinental by any means, but respectable enough for a carrier-based fighter. It also had a service ceiling of 11,000 meters and a climb rate of 75 meters per second. For a fighter of its time, especially such a niche and specifically engineered one, these figures are decent enough, but it all came at a cost. The secondary lift engines, while essential in achieving VTOL, were complete fuel guzzlers. This was a significant drawback, as it not only shortened the Yak 38's range, but also reduced the time that it could spend in the air, a critical factor in any combat scenario. The power of these engines being directed downwards also caused rapid wear and tear on runways and stirred up copious amounts of dust that could clog the engine intakes, reducing performance and increasing maintenance requirements. So, moving on to the Yak 38's armaments, the aircraft had a rather modest payload capacity. Its design included four hardpoints, and it could carry a maximum payload of two tons, significantly less than its contemporaries. For air to air engagements, the Yak 38 could be equipped with R 60 heat seeking missiles with a maximum range of 8 kilometers or 23 millimeter cannon pods. In the ground attack role, the Yak 38 could carry unguided bombs and rockets, as well as the formidable KH 23 anti ship missiles. However, the lack of a co pilot put the burden of aiming entirely on the pilot, which naturally made aiming these weapons a bit of a challenge. It's also worth noting that the Yak-38 had no internal cannon, though one was later retrofitted to some examples. It also had no radar. As a fleet defense fighter, it was supposed to spot, track, and engage enemy aircraft from afar. But without radar, it was sort of flying blind. Its capabilities were basically limited to getting in visual range and then letting the heat seekers do the rest. And as if the Yak 38's fuel inefficiency, limited armament, and lack of radar was not bad enough, it was also plagued by reliability issues, as evidenced by only one sixth of the first Kiev class Yak 38 complement being operational throughout its first cruise. Again, one sixth of them. It was also highly temperamental to fly and was widely considered to be a death trap. Often, one of its two lift jets would fail and the Yak-38 would be sent into a catastrophic and unrecoverable spin. To protect its pilots, an automatic ejection system that would automatically engage the ejector seat when sharp changes in pitch were detected was retrofitted, but this ejection system itself was also prone to failure and was known to trigger automatically during sharp turns or sometimes just for no reason at all. A bit of a monumental oversight that resulted not just in the loss of the aircraft, but also in in the abrupt end of the pilot's career. But surely the Act 38 must have had some redeeming qualities, right? I mean, sure, Soviet engineering of the 70s and 80s could be a bit uh, unrefined at times, but it was usually functional enough. I mean, surely 
Surely the Yak-38 must have had some redeeming merit somewhere. Well, to answer that question, let's bring this chapter to a bit of a close. <laughs> and move on to the Yak-38's operational history, shall we? And sadly, we've got to open this bit with a bit of bad news. If you came into this expecting some redeeming merit, some relativist perspective that would make the Yak-38 seem good, as we often do on this channel, this is one of the few instances where the, it doesn't seem to be any good at all. There is no, it would have been used had the Cold War gone hot, but it was fine for regional wars. No, it persevered, despite its flaws. No, it was later retrofitted and became the best thing since sliced bread. No, the sad reality of the matter is the Yak-38 simply wasn't a very good plane, and looking at its operational history does nothing except for reinforce that fact. We already know that the Yak-38's first deployment was a failure, with few of the aircraft being fit for service at any given time, one-sixth of them, and this would become the norm as the years went on. For example, in July 1979, when Yak-38s aboard the Minsk were sent to Vladivostok to form part of the Soviet Pacific Fleet, they were once again plagued by unreliability, and few were airworthy at any given time. This was no major problem for routine day-to-day -day operations, where only one or two aircraft had to be airworthy at any given time, but had the Cold War gone hot and the fleet had been sent down to Japan, their average airworthiness rate of 4 out of 16 oh, would certainly have created, well, some issues. So, let's fast forward to September 1982, where we find the third Kiev class carrier, the Nova Sirisk, on its maiden voyage to join the Pacific Fleet shortly after being commissioned. This voyage certainly had its positive moments, such as the successful interception of aircraft from the US Enterprise on the 16th of December. But once again, the Ag-38 was plagued by reliability issues, only having on average an airworthiness of 5 out of 16. And things only got worse too, because during this voyage, the Nova Rosirag lost two of its Yak-38s to the frontal engine failures that we mentioned earlier. But the Yak-38 didn't live out its entire service history as a hangar queen only coming out from time to time to perform the odd interception. It did see combat once in 1986 during the Soviet-Afghan war. and. Sadly for the Yak-38, it went about as well as you might expect it to go. Four Yak-38s were dispatched to the conflict as part of an experimental test of their ground-based capabilities, and there they carried out numerous combat sorties against the Taliban. However, the deployment was short-lived. The very VTOL capabilities that once gave it so much potential were found to be more of a hindrance than a help, causing extensive damage to airstrips. They saw it relegated to conventional takeoffs, where it was outperformed by more traditional aircraft, leading to its withdrawal from the theater in 1987. So, after this analysis, we feel pretty confident in saying that the Yak-38, all things considered, was a bit of a heap of junk, seemingly with no utility in the real world at best and being an unreliable death trap at worst. But given everything we've just learned about the Yak-38, one naturally wonders, well, how does it compare to the Harrier? And the answer is going to be badly. But just how badly, we have to know. And to answer that question, let's bring this chapter to a close and give it some proper consideration, shall we? And look, this comparison is more pertinent than it might first appear. Sure, it's interesting enough to compare the Harrier and that 38 purely for gawking purposes, but it also provides us with a lens to appreciate just how the Ak-38 actually was. Naturally, comparing the two aircraft is like comparing apples and oranges. The two couldn't be more different. Sure, they're both VTOL aircraft, and if you squint really, really hard, they do sort of have a parceling resemblance to each other. But that is where the similarities end, beyond the superficial. It is night and day, and the Harrier was every bit as fantastic as the Yak-38 was terrible. We said it before, we'll say it again. Nowhere is this skin-deep equivalence between the two better examples them with their radically different methods of achieving VTOL flight. The Harrier employed a single Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine with four rotatable nozzles that directed the engine's thrust downward for takeoff and horizontal for forward flight. This resulted in a simpler, more fuel-efficient system than the Yak-38, which, as we discussed earlier, used a triple engine configuration which added extra weight and was highly inefficient, the fuel guzzling. Performance-wise, the Yak-38 could reach a maximum speed of 1,200 
130 kilometers per hour with a range of 1300 kilometers and a service ceiling of 11,000 meters the harrier though slower with a top speed of just 1070 kph had a similar range and could reach altitudes up to 15,250 meters however the harrier's single engine design and superior fuel efficiency gave it an edge in endurance and operational flexibility the disparities also extend to the weapons and radar system compared to the yak 38's modest armament and capabilities that we discussed earlier the harrier had a larger payload and better radar capabilities which enabled it to carry out a wider variety of mission profiles its arsenal included the aim 9 sidewinder air-to-ground missiles bombs and rocket pods and as for radar well you know the harrier actually had it allowing it to track and engage targets at ranges that the yak 38 could only dream of the operational history of the two aircraft also starkly contrasts as we know the yak 38s deployment was very limited with its only combat stint being a brief deployment to afghanistan in 1986. the harrier on the other hand boasts a rich and successful combat history the aircraft's battlefield debut came during the Falklands War in 1982, where it played a pivotal role in securing British victory, operating from both land bases and aircraft carriers to provide close air support and air defense. It subsequently saw action in the Gulf War, the Yugoslav Wars, as well as the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, in each of which its performance is typically lauded. So, the Yak-38 owes oh, something of a dud, to say the least. But there are, however, some who say that it went on to have an impact on arguably the most advanced jet of the modern day, the F-35. This connection is very faint at best. But as it is an often touted part of the Yak-38's legacy, it is worth us paying just a little bit of heed to it today proponents of this theory argue that the connection to the f-35 began in september 1991 when the collapsing soviet union realized that it could no longer afford to continue developing the yak-141 the much improved successor to the yak-38 eager to not see their work go to waste yak entered discussions with several foreign partners who could help fund the program the lockheed corporation which was in the process of developing the f-35 for the u.s joint strike fighter program stepped forward and a 400 million dollar agreement to produce three new yak 141 prototypes for lockheed was reached knowing this some would go so far as to call the f-35 a knockoff of the yak 141 and by extension the yak 38 but the connection is weak in reality certainly their exhausts and the way they pivot does look similar but they are very very different systems the yak 141 utilized three engines in vtol flight just like the yak 38 whereas the f-35 uses just one engine assisted by auxiliary turbines not extra engines which makes its system much lighter and much more efficient as a result so with its connection to the f-35 being abstract at best and no other influence to really speak of the yak 38's true legacy is that of a technological dead end. So, look, on this channel, we enjoy diving deep into the nuanced corners of engineering, reevaluating preconceived notions, and attempting to unearth unsung merits of subjects otherwise labeled as failures. Yet, for the Yak 38, such an approach would be a joke. Even with our penchant for redemption narratives, we struggle to counter the near universal criticism that this aircraft has earned. In aviation, not every endeavor can be a soaring success. Look, the Yak 38 stands as a testament to that very fact. Sometimes, we just must confront a simple albeit hard truth some designs despite their bold aspirations and the hard work poured into them are simply failures and the yak 38 was one of them an interesting failure but a failure 